Um, the purpose of this afternoon is really to hear from profession-specific leads about quality. Um, and the brief was, you've got five minutes to talk about quality um, around your professions. And we are here to listen, to ask some questions. And what we're hoping is that there will be some themes that arise from this panel discussion, which will really help us think about how we might address some of those things going forward, but also celebrate some of the good stuff that is happening that works, and maybe dial up the stuff that's working and dial down the stuff that's not working. So it's a little bit uh, off-piste. The floor is yours, panellists. Um, uh, what I might do is I might just get you all to introduce yourselves as you start speaking, um, and then you have five minutes for some reflections. Then there'll be question and answers from the crowd, and then we'll move on to the next panellist. Over to you, Chris, then. Um, I might stand up. Um, OK. So I think for, for an age B, oh, my name's Chris, so Chris Tuckett, I'm a physiotherapist and a um, director of our lifestyle profession. Yeah, really good to be here today. I'm sorry I wasn't here this morning. I was um, welcoming up a batch of international um, age Bs. Um, help. That was really, really exciting this morning. So in terms of quality improvement, I think for me, and, and I'm sure it applies to the other professions as well, that it's kind of inherent in our practice, I think, day to day. <coughs> I think there's often the danger that we think of quality improvement as, as, as a thing that you kind of pick up, you do a quality improvement, and you put it back down. But from my perspective of you know, being a clinician and being all fantastic HP that do their work, yeah, every interaction they have with a patient or, or user of service, that's the form of quality improvement. So you know, they're doing their assessment, they're coming up with intervention, they're reassessing, making changes, tweaks. So they're constantly you know, making iterative changes, it's a continual improvement. So that's always happening. And I think as AHP particularly, and of course you know, I represent 10 professions at NELP, so it's quite a broad church and there's you know, lots of different clinical interventions going on within each of those professions. But by and large, I think quality improvement is inherent in what we do. So I think for me, it's really important, I think, to, to recognise that and to make sure that we don't see quality improvement as something which only those trained in quality improvement do. Only people who have done you know, specific courses, masters, you know, quality improvement isn't the reserve of specialist practitioners. Obviously, there are people who have a lot more skills in it, I think as HPs, you know, we come with a lot of those skills already. So I think that's really, really important to recognise. I think, in terms of, is there more we can do from an HP perspective? And I think yes. You know, I, I my, my master's in quality improvement, so I have a bit of an interest in this. I think there is definite strength and skills to be developed, and I know Nell has done a lot around kind of increasing the skill set of our um, HPs and, and, and the white staff body. I think there's definitely a part of that. And I think the more we can encourage our HPs to get involved in quality improvement, I think the more they'll reflect on their own skills and realise they have those skills, then of course being able to bolster them, <coughs> build them up, is critical for me. So I think QI, whilst you know, there's a huge amount to be learned, I think we all inherently have that within our profession. But what does get in the way of QI? So I think you, know, you could easily reel off the very simple things which is time, um, lack of resource, that might include finances, you know, staffing, all the things that we know get in the way of everything we, we try to achieve. So I think the kind of the magical bit about QI, if we don't see it as an addition to our role, and we see it as something that we do every day, is that it can actually help to relieve a few of those burdens. So if we see QI as something which is part of our day-to-day -day practice, <coughs> then for me it can make things more efficient. It can reduce the paperwork demands. It can reduce that time from referral to treatment or intervention. It can make the requirement for resource less intensive. You know, it can make the efficiency around funding better for us, but also for our team and the trust. So I think if we can see QI as something which you know, will ease those burdens, will give us more resource, and I think again that allows us a real route in to utilising QI in our kind of day-to-day -day practice, um, 
but also you know, the bed fit of our service users. <coughs> Essentially, we're here to deliver a service, and if we can deliver a more efficient service, a more timely service, a service that costs less, all of which QI can facilitate, then you know, that's almost a, a win-win there. So I think there are other things that we do need, and it, and it does touch on the last point around that skill set. So I think you know, making sure that we see QI as accessible, making use of the resources of the QI team, who I know are, are much more out there now, kind of embedded on the ground with the team, and I think that, that's really, really critical for me. So I think the two key things that we as kind of professionals and clinicians and, and staff and health need to, to deliver QI is kind of good intent, so we want to make things better, and I think you can say that for pretty much all staff and health. Then also curiosity, just to see where those opportunities are. I think they're the two things that allow QI to kind of really thrive as an organisation. And I see that in the work of our ASPs kind of every day, you know, every day of the month, and all the service improvements they're delivering every day. What do my kind of ASPs require? I think they, they do require that support. I think you know, the QI support is there. I think it's a lot more accessible now than it perhaps was previously. I think there is the offer of training. I think that's key. I think it's also something just around, you know, that confidence to shout up and share the QI and the learning that's already happening. So again, I think it's really important that we don't see it as something else to be done, because otherwise then it becomes more difficult <coughs> to do it. So if we just can, as leaders, you know, see and notice when improvements are, are raised to us, flag it, make sure people get the acknowledgement for that, help them to share and disseminate their work, you know, we've seen some fantastic examples of QI projects um, which you know, we, we, we try and share more broadly. So whether it's um, you know, BMJ awards or NHS England kind of sustainability network or um, you know, sharing it with kind of, um, the GERF programme and things like that. So making sure that the, the QI projects, even if they haven't been formally recognised as QI by the people delivering them, are known about and reflect on the good work they're doing, that really helps them to feel empowered to do more and then sharing it as widely as possible. It just helps AHP to be seen as you know, proponents of QI, but also help those individuals who deliver the work to recognise actually what they've been doing all, all along has been QI. I think that's really key. Any examples of improvement in professions are most proud of? So there's been, there's been loads that have knelt, and I think actually you know, a lot of QI, or a lot of improvement, actually comes from necessity. So we've had the, the pandemic, which um, might not be completely gone, but it's kind of in the rear view mirror to an extent. And you know, we saw great examples of um, respiratory physio services being delivered remotely. So, you know, patients and users of service having to very quickly get used to you know, inter interacting with our physiotherapists and other clinicians um, remotely, having exercise classes, um, being able to spot the signs of um, deterioration in the patients, you know, all these things that have to be thought about, but delivered very quickly. And then haven't been stepped down post pandemic entirely because actually they delivered a lot of really good benefits. They've heard from Rhiannon and the other speaker of the team around their domiciliary and um, post laryngectomy service, um, which I think is almost a country first service. Yeah, again, and with some added benefits of that, of you know, reducing kind of miles travelled, so that sustainability aspect, which we know is a big priority for the NHS over the next few years. Um, we've had uh, some dietitians who have reduced the packaging required for supplements in the community, which when the cost are kind of multiplied out, it's saving kind of thousands and thousands of pounds. Um, and these are all kind of QI projects which, not they say all, but you know, in many cases they kind of just stumbled across them and realised they have other impacts. We might call them balancing measures, but they're, they're added benefits, if you like. Um, so you know, huge numbers of examples from HP. What we want to do differently, I think that the QI team is out there now in terms of being out on the ground. I think that's really key for me, is making sure that the team have access to QI kind of professionals, if you like, who are able to spot when they're delivering QI, who are able to say, you know, that's a really great project. This could be, why don't we think about capturing the data this way, we could present it this way, why don't you share it in this conference, um, and have you thought about these added benefits you're finding? So making sure that QI is out there now in the clinical services, I think that's going to make a massive difference. Just to capture the QI that's already going on, as well as, of course, hoping to increase the number of QI projects that take place as well. And what would be most appropriate for our professional group? I think because we have such a variety of roles, so there's 10 professions, you know, it's difficult to pick up a template. 
and just put, apply it to all the professions. But I think if we can utilise QI in the correct way, in that it is a very kind of nimble, um, it can be very short, sharp and quick, it's continuous, then the professions will dictate how best to use QI. And I think the QI team there is just to enable and facilitate that as best as possible. Um, I think trying to apply a, a QI framework necessarily to the professions can be difficult, it can be very different for each, each group. Um, and I think just having that support and, and really ensuring we capture what's going on and disseminate it as widely as possible. I think we can have a, a national impact. We've seen some of our projects we have, to have that attention nationally. I think that's really important if we reflect on the um, retention recruitment problems that we have. You know, if we can make NELF known for good quality delivery of care and innovation, because a lot of these projects are really innovative, that captures people's attention. Um, it can really put us on the map in terms of then attracting the future recruitment. So yeah, just a big thank you to all the HBs who are in the room and outside the room because they're, they're doing that QI work every day. Thank you. Great, thank you. Chris, any, any questions for Chris? So you were saying about, um, you know, that actually using the QI team to kind of help recognise improvements being made um, and sort of, you know, actually highlight that actually that those improvements could be QI. Obviously, there's not huge numbers of us to get around the thousands of HP. So, is there sort of a particular meeting or a particular place that you think actually it would be good to talk about what the improvements that are being made um, within services? So, yeah, I think now we've got the now we've got, we've got our paper league meeting things that you know about already, and we've got a professional forum, and um, we have had one for QI already. But I think. You know, with the professional lead that we've now got to a housing director of the board, um, we've now got, you know, a, a bolstered on the leadership team, if you like. I think it's, there's no just on them to hear about the projects going on um, and to make sure that that is flagged up. And then linking in with, you know, comms team, if we're going to kind of national conferences and that type of thing, um, making sure that the research team are involved, so if there's anything we feel could go down that route. I think it's, we have a network now which is much stronger than it used to be. I think it's utilising those networks as best as possible, um, but making sure that the HP out there feel they can come to us directly, share their work with us, because I think previously they might not realise that what they're doing is innovative and worth sharing. They might just got on with their work, you know, because they're busy and the capacity, but if they can just drop us an email or just flag that I think my work's you know, worth shouting about, and we can help them take it the rest of the way. Um, so I think if we can just let them know that that is something to think about, then it will hopefully come up um, you know, through the different networks that we have. There is probably one specific group, I imagine. Thank you, Chris. Any other questions for Chris? Before we move on to our next panel member? No? Thank you, Chris. So over to Sue, who is not only a pioneer, but I think, Sue, correct me if I'm wrong, but you started up the first QI team here at Nelft. I did a long time ago. A long time ago. Chrissy. <laughs> so well, welcome Sue, over to you. Okay, thank you. I'm Sue Lee Smythe. Um, I'm Director of Nursing for Trustwide Mental Health Inpatients and I'm here to represent nursing in the organisation. All nursing. Um, so I'm a mental health nurse but I recognise there are hundreds of different kinds of nurses in the organisation. And just really thinking about this from a nursing point of view. So hopefully you'll have lots of questions and if you're a nurse and you want to chip in and I've forgotten something, then please let me know. But this is just kind of my reflection on the questions that Mirek gave us. Um, and just really thinking um, about prioritising quality, but thinking about how much improvement actually occurs within NELF. And I started off thinking about it from an individual point of view. As an individual, how do you improve? Um, you know, so how am I improved as a nurse? And I know you're all going to find this really hard to believe, but I've been a nurse 40 years this year. I know, it's amazing. Oh. Um, and, and, and just thinking about how you kind of improve on a daily basis, a weekly basis, a monthly basis. And the fact that, how do, how do we capture that? How do we capture people's individual journeys where their quality improves as part of who they are and what they 
do and how you change the way you practice over time. So I kind of went to a very kind of granular level. I really thought about your experience, your learning, supervision, appraisal, revalidation, but we all love that every three years. Do you know what I mean? But all of these are opportunities for you to really develop and improve and improve the way you practice and develop. Um, and, and then thinking about you improving within your teams and your team working and how do we capture that? Um, because not all improvement will be, you know, sort of labelled as QI. <coughs> and I've had lots of conversations with Mirek from when he started, you know, very much kind of around the whole, you know, kind of QI headline. It's a process, um, you have to do it, there are stages, it takes ages. Um, and actually kind of the feeling that that's probably not what it needs to be. Um, and I think, you know, Mirek's very clear that that's not what it should be. It should be more about us recognizing our own improvements as individuals and teams and being able to capture that and capture the impact that that has on our patients and carers and our colleagues and the way we deliver um, what we do. So I'm quite passionate about that, about really taking it back to its most um, basic level. So and what gets in the way? Well, I did a little straw poll earlier of um, when we all looked on the panel, when we all looked at these questions and when we actually wrote something down. <laughs> and the overwhelming feeling was Sunday, <laughs> yesterday. And that for me, reflecting on this, is really clear about how we all live our lives and how we plan things or not, as the case may be, and how we're all working very long hours and doing things on the weekend to just fit them in and get them done. Um, and I really sort of thought about that. So when what gets in the way, stuff, stuff, and it can be home, it can be life, it can be work, it can be any of those things, but I don't think there's anybody in this room who would tell me they're working their hours at the moment. Um, and, and so for me, you know, what gets in the way is all of that. And what do we need and want? And I keep saying this, and Caroline's been in meetings where I've said this, particularly in art, if we want people to be able to reflect and improve, we need to give them time, and I know Chris mentioned time, space, and headspace. You, you can't walk around keeping all the stuff in your heads that we keep in our heads every day, and then, you know, and be able to allow yourselves to reflect. So we need some capacity and some space to do that. And certainly in terms of nursing, which is 24 seven profession, you know, and so we've got people working shifts, we've got people working kind of all hours of the day and night. Sometimes it's really difficult to get together in your team or with your colleagues or to come to the nurses forum, um, which we run, or to come to nurses day, which was on Friday, and actually have that space and that time because of all the commitments and the way that you work and the way your diaries are managed. It's very difficult to free that time up. So I think for nurses, what I would be asking for is a commitment to give us that headspace and that time, um, and then it not be superseded by everything else. And just going back to supervision, um, and in relation to kind of thinking about Chris as an AHP and thinking about a psychology <coughs> colleague at the other end. Thank <laughs> <laughs> That's the other Scottish one. <laughs> so thinking about, the thinking about those professions, thinking about AHP and psychology, and probably medical as well, and I don't know about pharmacy, Amy, but nursing, supervision, is a bit of an add-on in nursing. It's not something that's really kind of baked into the model of what we do. You know, and that's where we should have that headspace and capacity. But every single nurse in the room will tell you, as soon as something happens, the first thing that gets scored out in the diary is supervision, you know? And I know I'm guilty as well. I say to people, sorry, I'm gonna have to move your supervision. Can we do it in two weeks? Can we do it tomorrow? Because it, it's not protected. So I think in terms of nursing, we need that protected time, we need that commitment, and we need that proactive planning to allow us space to really think, of, sit down and reflect on what we've done. Because we haven't done nothing. We're not, not doing improvement. We're not, not looking at quality. We just haven't got the space to really think about that. And then think about where we're going to go next. And then, so it was um, sort of what's changed 
um, in terms of you know you as a profession. And I was thinking about the last 40 years, and I thought, bloody hell. Well, Flo's died. I'm really sorry, I have to yeah. say. Um, we're not sort of ruled by Florence Nightingale anymore. But um, and we've left a lot of that behind. We've left a lot of that um, Dr. Handmaid and stuff behind. You know, we're now autonomous practitioners. We're a de degree level profession. Um, you know, we've, we've, we're doing a lot more. We've got advanced nurse practitioners. You know, we really are a lot more autonomous. Um, and in terms of that, you know, we're able to work in kind of systems with families um, and patients and carers a lot more autonomously and direct and deliver care and treatment for them. And within that, we need to recognize that. And we need to be looking at how we can maximize that in terms of improving and thinking about QI and where does QI fit with that. And then it was what does the QI team need to do differently? And actually, I think in the last year or so, we've really seen a real change. And it's not been about us coming to QI, you know, and coming to QI days and coming to QI training. And certainly for me, and I think particularly with the mental health inpatient wards, QI, the QI team are on the ground. They're in our meetings. Um, they're in our huddles. They're really thinking about working alongside. And if they're doing that in mental health nursing, then I imagine and I hope they're doing that in, in other you know, places in nursing. And as nurses, that's what we need. You know, we haven't got time to kind of come to you and you know, constantly be asking. We need you alongside us and working with us to, you know, to move forward and make those developments. Um, and I think that's me. Thank you, Sue. Any questions for Sue? Not looking at our nursing colleagues in the crowd, but any, <laughs> any reflections from our nursing colleagues or any questions? Um, I think you said about um, with like supervisions and appraisals, um, like trying to get protected time for it. Well, my name's Maggie, I'm district, district nursing. And it's, we just find it absolutely impossible. And um, I'm finding that when we do the supervisions and the appraisals, it's, they're not really meaningful, they're just, it's a tick box. And I, I mean, um, I probably do all of the supervisions for four teams or district nurses because the DN, DNBs just don't have time or capacity. So I'm kind of doing it really to meet a health requirement rather than just making it really sort of like meaningful for um, staff. And the only sort of meaningful ones that I do do are um, if somebody's on the support plan or I've got like, mm. concerns about somebody's practice. Mm. So it's just, it's always about trying to find that protected time, which I've looked at all the different ways of trying to get, do that, but I still haven't come up with the answer yet. And I absolutely agree with you, and that's where the culture shift needs to happen. Yeah. You know, we, we can't keep coming together and saying, oh, we're, you know, we're going to do this, it's going to be great, it's going to be marvelous, it's going to change your lives. But without, without really looking at the culture and the way that we are set up in the organisation and the way the systems and processes work, <coughs> we won't be able to make that change. And, and as I said at the beginning, looking at it from a granular level, you know, it's, I enjoy supervision. Um, which is a bit of an odd thing to say to some people I know dread. But, you know, I enjoy supervision. I've got supervision later on this afternoon with my line manager. And, you know, we, we actually, but to be fair though, my supervision's after five. And, and I think, that, again, that's reflective of what I've been saying. But I enjoy it because it's a chance to really discuss things and explore things and think about things. Um, we need to be able to allow nurses to be able to do that in work time and have the same experience that I have yeah. when I have supervision. Mm -hmm. um, it's, a, it's a development. Can I just come back on something really interesting? Because I'm not a nurse, but I don't think. I've worked in community therapy, like nursing services, and so I know the speed and, and etc. How could, if you have unlimited, if you had, I mean, what would be your solution if you did?
So you can plan supervision, and then somebody might go off sick or a patient become very unwell, and then they will. And so we have a lot of unplanned visits yeah, as well. Yeah. So it's um, yeah, it would be. I mean, I think supervision is great, and uh, you know, for learning and development. But uh, I do most of the supervision, and I'm talking about sort of 20, 20, 21, 22 staff, and. Uh, I do just do it as a nail to the time because I want to get 100%. I don't want like, I don't want like business of four people, four people in the factory saying you're not performing. So that's the way that's the way that, that I do it. I just ask the, the staff just to um, just type something in for me and I have a look at it. If, they, if there's something of concern, I'll, I will call them and have a look at chat. But usually it's the same old thing. They use a template and they're just copy and pasting, which is not right. So I mean, and just like so it's something that is supervision time, those fundamental basics of providing care and having that support. Here is, you've probably got transformation projects being dumped on you, the QI guys want to be QI, but you're just saying, I don't even have time at lunchtime to do supervision with my staff, and you want me to do all that sort of stuff. 
So, you know, it's really, really, it's a fundamental problem, and I think Chris is right. It does need approaching from both ends. The leadership bit to enable time to focus on stuff, because what happens in an aeroplane? Who do you put a mask on first, your kids or yourself? It's you, so you can put the mask on your kids so they can survive. So I'm not saying our kids are impatient, but you get my drift. Sorry, it was Angela and Lucy. Yeah. Yes, on a similar track, but I think we need to be looking at our band five and six years as well, and how we can release time for these <coughs> type of projects, because they are the ones doing the bulk of on the ground work. And I can speak for all three of us, if any of our band five or six came up to us with a really good idea and said, I really want to take this forward and do a QI project, automatically get a yes from us because there's so much we have to look at resources staffing the next few months so it's really sad to say that we are not in a position to say yeah go and take that project away and run with it because there's all these other factors that we're having to weigh up but i know there's definitely no well i don't know definitely but there's not band five or six bm colleagues of mine here and i think that's quite an area we have to look at how can we get them band in on board I think that's really important and that's something we had nurses day on Friday and every year since I've been the director of nursing in this organisation we've done a real push to get band fives and six engaged with going to these things um, and it's it's a real it's a real struggle because they do tend to be you know out there and on the front line and the other people I would say certainly I feel come under the nursing umbrella are healthcare support workers there are healthcare support workers are out there on the front line and certainly um, we have a meeting that happens every two weeks um, in the mental health inpatient wards and it's called the respect meeting and it's about reducing restrictive practices like restraint and rapid tranquilization and reducing violence and aggression and every other week is a meeting the meeting is just for healthcare support workers um, and and they come along and they're really engaged and they have some fantastic ideas and they really they really thought about how they can make changes and make improvement in Chrissy comes and Mirek comes, you know, and, and, and again, you know, it's, it's, I think it's, you know, I'm on board, you, you don't need to engage me with this, I'm already on board, you know, as are probably most of the people in this room, but what about all the people that aren't in this room and don't feel able to come to, you know, these kind of events, and, and that for me is about why I said about the QIT, you need to be alongside us, you need to be walking the floor with us, because that's where, you know, you, capture these people and, and what they're thinking and what their view is and you know <coughs> most people are young and they're enthusiastic i mean i'm old i'm past it you know but yeah we want to kind of capture those people that are coming new you know and they've still got all that energy and enthusiasm and they can really see what a difference they can make mm -hmm. um, but yeah so just on the positive note i did do a qi for six years ago i was talking to kelly earlier and um, the changes that i made then really really positive and I audit those uh, changes that I implemented and they are still they are, uh, the results I get back are still 100% so the framework is brilliant it's really good the driver diagrams the PDSA all of that I use as a framework now when I'm implementing changes so um, the, the, the training that I did is still there in practice so, that's um, brilliant we yeah. have to capture your sustainability piece yeah and help you write this up yeah. as to why it has worked. So to make sure Kelly gets in touch with you and capture that. So Lucy, then Steve, and then we'll move on to Amy our third panel. Thanks. Yeah, I was just picking up from Chris's point. It's not um, now because doing all this amazing stuff with QI, but it's the buy-in from the stakeholders external to us as well that need persuading that we have to agree with the perspectives, you know, uh, because they have so much influence on our leadership and so I guess it's just a, a, such a large system shift isn't it? Yeah but thankfully I know I've done work with the CQC <coughs> over the last six and a half years they're really focused on improvement and it doesn't matter what the method, method, methodology is but what are the improvement in staff outcomes, service outcomes, patient outcomes and value system and financial stuff so what is the cost of delivering those outcomes? That's when we talk about value. So our regulators are definitely in that space. Our ICB colleagues have this whole QI program. I'm not sure how it interplays with us, but it's there. 
and there is a national focus on improvement. So I think I think we're doing it. It's just harnessing it and aligning it, and, and you know we all have a part to play in that quality area. But you're, you're absolutely right. There's just systemic things that we need to think about. Right, Steve. Last comment, and then we'll go to Yeah, so I just want to comment a bit on this uh, stuff about supervision because it really sort of saddens me to hear that there are sort of clinicians who are doing really hard work, really stressful work, you know, and distressing work at times who aren't getting sort of regular supervision. And I pretty much agree with Chris, I might phrase it slightly differently. <laughs> you know, you know, if, to me, if you're not getting regular supervision, can you do your you know, your best. Can you can you deliver sort of best patient care without it? Is it not an essential part of our work? That's sort of how I would think about it. So it's not quite saying uh, you know staff <laughs> or patients, but it's actually I see it's a sort of a critical thing. I guess I feel sort of uh, quite uh, uh, privileged really in, in psychiatry and the training in psychiatry. It's sort of absolutely enshrined. You sit down with your clinical supervisor once a week for an hour throughout. And that's just sort of like baked into the, the thing that if you don't get it, people complain about it and uh, people take your trainees away from you for consultants and things like that. You know. So it's, uh, yeah, so, it, it, so I suppose what I'm saying is it does seem to work in psychiatry. Mm -hmm. So there's no reason why it couldn't work in other professions if you really, really want it to. Mm -hmm. And maybe it is a, you know, it's a complex problem, maybe it's, maybe it's a cure. But, but I, just to go on that point, so we have a 